I'm too busy right now. One day, yes, I'll be right there with you side by side, but right now is just not the time. I've got too many things on my plate, too many things in my own world that I'm focusing on that I don't have time to, to reach out into somebody else's world. There are some of you who may hear the call and say, the call is, is, the, is the right thing, but, but what do I personally have to give? I understand that we need to be on mission in our communities, among our neighbors, in, our, in this town, but, but I really don't have anything to offer. I know the call to, to serve the church is there, but, but whatever I could do is of such insignificance. I don't know that it's worth my time or yours to give. There are others that hear it, and they, they're ready to get up and get going, but unfortunately, their motivations might be a little bit askew. They've got this view of their life that says that they want it, they, everything's being put in a scale, a balance. And they're trying to, to weigh everything, the good and the bad, and, and here's this call to serve, and wow, if I do that, then maybe the, my balance of my life will, will lean more towards the good than the bad, and God will think better of me. There's different ears who hear this call in different ways, and so when Daniel called and asked me to, to speak, I, I had all of that in mind, and I thought, I need to find a passage that could speak to each one of those people. Plus, knowing that he has been teaching and calling you to serve in a variety of different ways, I needed to find a passage that he was least likely to have preached on before on this subject. I guess in retrospect, I could have just called him up and said, hey, could you tell me some of the passages you've been teaching on? Uh, but I wasn't wise enough to do that. Um, so I thought, Lord, what, what passage could I go to that I'm safe that I won't preach something that he's already preached, but which will also address each person where they are? And I think I found that passage. In fact, I think I found that book. And I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of Haggai. Now, if you're going to use your pew Bible, I looked it up. It's on page 667. It's the third book from the end of the Old Testament, if you look for it. I told uh, Daniel this morning, I said, you know, when I, I wrote you and told you I was going to preach from uh, Haggai, you probably thought I misunderstood what the, the, why you called me here today. Um, but he said he trusted that this would be the, the um, passage that the Lord had led for me to, to preach through. And now after hearing uh, the music that Kathy selected for this morning, um, I feel confident this was indeed God's design. You're going to think that she and I had planned this ahead of time. Now, most people are not familiar with the book of Haggai, so I want to give you a little bit of context. Uh, the context can actually be found in the book of Ezra. I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but if you ever want to know the background of Haggai, just read the book of Ezra and you've got it. But in short, what has happened is that the, the people of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, had been disobedient to the Lord. They had been idolatrous. They had been doing things their own way in the, the Warning had come time and again from the Lord. If you do not get right with me, then my judgment is going to fall upon you. Your kingdom's going to fall. You're going to be taken off into exile. They didn't listen, and that's indeed what happened. The country of Babylon came in, nation of Babylon came in and, and attacked them, attacked Judah, sacked the city, destroyed the temple, took the Jews off into captivity, and there they remained. That is, until a man named Cyrus, became the first king of Persia. And when he became king of Persia, he attacked Babylon and destroyed it. And the thing that was good for the Jews was after he destroyed Babylon, he said to them, you captives, you can go free. Go back to your home. Go rebuild what you have lost. And that's what they did. They headed back. And they went back to Jerusalem. And they began to, to rebuild. They began to rebuild the most important thing in their lives, which was the temple. And they had gotten as far as building the foundation of that temple, and they were exciting and rejoicing. But there were people around the area that did not like this. They were enemies of the Jews, and they tried to undermine their work. And the perfect opportunity arose when Cyrus died. And they went to the next king of Persia, Artaxerxes, and they said to him, You know, these Jews, they're, they're out there rebuilding their temple, but they are rebellious and wicked people. And if you allow them to rebuild the temple, they're just going to rebel against you. And, 
And you know, they, they, right now they are, in essence, they're your subjects in your vast kingdom. But if you think that you're going to get taxes from them, if you think you're going to get obedience from them, you're mistaken. All they have to do is get up, up on their feet, and they are going to show you that they think that they are boss. You need to tell them, stop building that temple. And so he listened to them, and he told them, indeed, they needed to stop. And they did. And that went on for about eight months when Artaxerxes died. And the next king of Persia arose, Darius, and this created a great opportunity, the Jews felt for them. They, they approached him and they said, listen, King Cyrus had given us a promise that we could return home and we could rebuild the temple and we had been laboring at it. But then we were told to stop, but that's just not right. Don't you think that you ought to honor the wishes of the first king of Persia? Let us return to work. Let us fulfill our mission. And Darius gave them ear, and he said, you know what, I think you're right. So get back to work. And I'll tell you what, if anybody tries to stop you, they're going to have to deal with me. So during that time, God rose up a man named Haggai as a prophet to speak to the Jews. And that gives us the background of Haggai. Now, Haggai is divided up into four messages that came from God to the Jews. They all came in the year 520 B.C., and we can even date them. The first one came in August, one came in October, and two of them came in December. And I want to look at each of those in turn. And now I'm going to talk a little bit faster than I usually do because I've got a lot of ground to cover. It's my intention is for us to go all the way through the book of Haggai. And I'm asking the Lord to bless us and that and bless me with speedy voice and you with quick ears to hear. So we're going to read, starting in chapter 1, verse 1, going through verse 15. This is the first message, August 29th of 520 B.C. And this is what we read. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but you have harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labor of your hands. I'm going to stop there for a moment. What is going on here? They had stopped building and had gotten focused on themselves. And when Darius said, you can build again, and the call goes out, all right, folks, let's get busy again working on the house of the Lord, their reply to that call was, not yet. Not yet. It's not yet time to build the house of the Lord. Why was that their response? Because they were too busy building houses for themselves. And to be honest, this is where the majority of the church lives these days. They live in their own paneled houses. The call goes forth to go forth and work. Come work for the house of the Lord. And the response is, not now. I have got my own stuff to get in order. Not now, not now, not now. And my question to you is, is this you? And if so, what is the paneled house that you are building for yourself? It may literally be your house, but it may be your job. It may be a hobby. It may be school. It may just be pure laziness. And you say, this, this is the house in which I'm going to dwell. I don't have time for the house of the Lord. I've got my own things to worry about. And God's words are, get your priorities straight. 
I always come before you. My house always comes before your house. My kingdom always comes before your kingdom. And then God points out something that they may have seen but had not made the connection that what they were experiencing was a symptom of where they had placed their hearts. In verse 5, he says, Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. And he's pointing out a frustration that the people were experiencing. They don't have time for God's house, but the things that they do find time for are not satisfying them. They can't seem to get on top of things. The things they are taking time for are not uh, producing the results they had been hoping for. It's not supplying the satisfaction they were yearning for. They sow much, but they harvest little. They eat, but they don't get enough. They drink, but they never have their fill. They put on clothes, they're never warm. They They earn money, but it seems to disappear as if there's holes in their pockets. Have you ever felt that way? No matter what you set yourself to, you never get to the point where you feel like you're finished, that you've accomplished it, that you're satisfied. Are you the person who says, Pastor, I hear your call, and as soon as, and then you fill in the blank with whatever you fill that blank in with, as soon as fill in the blank happens, then I will get busy. As soon as I get fill in the blank done, then I'll be right there. But that day never comes because that fill-in-the-blank is never finished. It is always elusive. Pastor, as soon as I get on top of my bills, then I'll get busy. And yet, you just can't seem to get on top of them. It's like a hamster wheel that you're running on. You just can't get it done. And so the call remains unanswered. Why? God says, because I keep blowing those things away. And the reason I do it is because here's my house that lies in ruins while you're so busy with your own stuff. You're holding your own things, your own projects, your own focus over top of the things that God is calling you to. And so God keeps those things keeps this tension going, keeps them just out of your reach because if you were actually able to accomplish them, you'd feel justified in holding those things over God's house, your house over God's house. You, you'd get it done and then, you, then you'd say, okay, now I'm ready to start working for the Lord. And you would feel justified in putting those things first. See, it's a good thing that I focused on myself before I offered myself unto the Lord because I was looking at all the things I was able to get done. And those things would remain your idol, your God, the one that takes priority in your life. And what happens when something comes along and threatens those things that you've been focused on? What are you going to do? Maybe you're working for the Lord at that point, but something comes and focuses the things that are really important. You're going to drop the work of the Lord and you're going to run back to those. Say, Pastor, I'm sorry, I've got to attend to the things that really matter. And God says, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you stay there. I'm not even going to let you get there. I'm going to keep you unsatisfied because I am not going to allow you to piddle your lives away on worthless things. Now, Jesus addressed this in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, passage I think probably most of us here are very familiar with. Starting in verse 22, it says, Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor is dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O little, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink or worry about it. 
For the pagan world runs after such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek His kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Don't be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no mouth, uh, moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the point being that if these are the things that you are focused on, namely your food and your clothes and, and your shelter, then you are indeed focusing on things that will wear out. Things that will fail. Things that thieves will come and uh, steal. Things that moths will destroy. And that is where your heart is. God says, I'm not content with leaving you there. I'm not content with you living in your life. And so we've got this, all this unfinished business in our life. And we say, God, why can't I get this stuff done? Why can't I get on top of things? And God says, because I'm not going to allow you to live in paneled houses. While my house lies in ruins. And that can be a painful time in life sometimes, can't it? A frustrating time. There's a quote from C.S. Lewis that I quote often. It says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He shouts to us in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to the world. Sometimes these times of trying to get on top of things can be painful times. But God is shouting to us in the midst of them. And those moments, our lives are like living parables. Where God says, I am going to show you the futility of what you're seeking after. I'm going to show you that it will not satisfy by not allowing you to experience the satisfaction of it. Does that challenge any of you? No, it challenges me. I am too quick to be about the business of my own house before the house of the Lord. Picking up in chapter 1, it's a couple of verses. Actually, I'm going to come to them at the end. But it says, Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Juzadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. Now I'm going to come back to that, so let's go on to chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. This is the next message. This came on October 17th, 520 B.C. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, O Zerubbabel declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and dry land. I will shake all nations, and, and the desired of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. So at this point, the people have been working on the temple for about a month and a half, but they've become discouraged. Verse 3, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? It is, is it as nothing in your eyes? What's going on is the people have been working, but they look at what their hands have made, and they said, this doesn't amount to anything. I remember what the temple looked like. And what I'm doing doesn't even compare. They felt helpless to match its previous glory. They felt like they really could not do a good job. And it discouraged them. And some of you may feel that same sort of helplessness. Daniel says, come on church, let's go. And he said, but what have I got to give? 
what kind of work are you expecting out of me? I've got really nothing to offer. I've got limited resources, limited abilities. If I don't contribute, nobody will notice. What's what I can give? What's it in the grand scheme of things? And I could really see that as being a temptation here in this church in particular because I walk in this building, I walk up to this building, this is a beautiful building. And it tells a rich story about a group of people who came to this town and wanted to honor the Lord through the work of their hands and to serve this community. And I look at the stained glass windows and just think of what it took to get to this point. The blood, sweat, and tears that those who came before you must have put into to build this church and to be God's people in the center of this town. I'm sure you think back on those days that Billington Baptist was probably, probably was, the center of Billington. And now the town has grown up. Cars fly down Main Street. They may not even know this building is here anymore. And you say... What have we got to offer in today's world? What is it that we might be able to do? What is it that we could possibly contribute? And God says, don't, don't start thinking that way. You know what we call that? Stinking thinking, right? That's not the way we think about the challenge that's put before us. I think about a woman named Lou. She was the first woman who became a believer in my first ministry. She was a woman who, in her early 20s, uh, suffered kidney failure and had been on dialysis Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of every week of her life. When we met her, she was around 40. She was a 40-year-old woman in a 65-year-old body, and she was worn out. She had a pacemaker put in, and she would say, what have I got to give? What do I, could I possibly do? And what she did is she volunteered in our church office. She became my volunteer secretary on Tuesdays and Thursdays on her days off. But even then, she'd say, really, I have nothing that I can do. I have limited talent, limited resources, nothing I can do. But unbeknownst to her, God was doing a work through her that went beyond her abilities. I would hear it all the time from people in my church. They would look at Lou. They'd say, you know what, Doug? When I see Lou, I am challenged by that woman. For all that she has been through, she's still here in that church office every Tuesday and Thursday. If that was me, I'd be at home in bed. When I see Lou, I see someone who God has gotten a hold of, and he's using her in ways that she doesn't even recognize because I get up in the morning and I say, if Lou can do it, I can do it too. And one day I was talking to Lou, and she was kind of down on herself again. She goes, I have nothing to offer. I don't, even, I don't have physical strength. I don't have anything. And I said, Lou, let me tell you a story about a woman who was physically incapacitated, was not able to do much, but the people around her saw in her Christ. What they saw in her was a love of the Lord, and that challenged them so much that they got up when they were feeling weak, and they served stronger than they otherwise would have. They went about the, their business thinking about how can I serve God because if Lou can do it, I can do it. Well, I didn't say her name. I said, Lou, who am I talking about? She said, I don't know. Who's that? I said, Lou, that's you. It's the bottom line. It isn't about what you have to offer. It's what God is going to do in you and through you and around you. Look at what he says here. What, you, look, you look at the temple and you see what you've done and you're thinking that it's nothing in your eyes and he says this, I am with you. I have covenant with you. My spirit's in your midst. I will fill this house with glory. In other words, don't focus on what you were able to do. Don't focus on the impact that your little things will have. You just do what you can do for the Lord and then let Him take care of those things. It's not our jobs to judge whether or not what little we can do is worth it in the long run. It's not our jobs to think about, to measure up the worth. 
We just do what we can do and then let God bring His glory and His power through it. And we do not know what little He may take and derive the most glory from. You know, the church I came from in, in Virginia, we were a small church. We never owned our own building. We never got very big. In fact, when we came down here, the, we had a meeting voted just to go ahead and, and close the doors so that the people could go on and, and be viable members of other churches in that area instead of trying to find a pastor to pastor this little church. And it would have been very easy for us to say, what are we doing here? I mean, there's other churches in here. What, what could we possibly accomplish here? But you know, in that time that I was there, God would bring in an individual and begin to work on their lives. And we had a young woman who was an English major at Virginia Tech. And she said, Doug, in the time that I've been here, all we've been doing is serving people and serving our community and serving those in need. And it's challenged me. I think I want to become a missionary. Right now, she's serving in Nigeria. We have three young men, one who's a pastor here in North Carolina, one who's a missionary in India, and one who's a pastor in Texas all from that tiny little congregation that if you would have asked me to measure it in a scale, it didn't amount to much. But that wasn't my job to measure whether it amounted to much or not. It was to trust the Lord and just get busy. Say, God, you do what you're going to do. And he says, I will fill this house with my glory. You just get busy doing what you can do. All right, verse 10. I'm going to try to talk faster. Now, I'll just let you know, uh, you all went over by about 10 minutes this morning before I, got, I was allowed to come up here. So I get 10 minutes. That's the way it works, right? All right. And then once I get into my 10 minutes, I'm going to come up with another story while I get another 10. No, I won't do that. Okay, so verse 10, on the 24th day of the ninth month, the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priest what the law says. If a person carries consecrated meat in the fold of his garment and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, so it is with these people in this nation of my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before. One stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone came to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. From this day on, I will bless you. Now, this comes as a kind of a, a parenthesis, a little a pause here, because here they are serving. Some of them saying, I don't know what this is going to amount to, and God challenges them on that. But then he says, now I want you to make sure that you keep something straight here. When I call you to work... We need to make sure that you understand how this works. And he asked this question. I'm going to kind of sum up instead of taking the time to walk us through that, to summarize it really quickly. Basically, he asked the question to the priest, is holiness contagious? And they say no. And he says, now on the other hand, does dirtiness spread? And the answer is yes. And you just think about that, that uh, proverb, you know, the, a rotten apple spoils the whole bunch. If you've got a a uh, um, bunch of rotten apples, you don't throw a good apple in the midst of them thinking that good apple is going to rub off on the, the spoiled apples and making them all good, right? We know that's not how it works. Instead, that good apple is going to become rotten really quick. And that's what they're saying. That, that's how things happen. And the point is that there are some people who will get to work and they will say that they can become, they believe that they can become holy by association. There's people who think that all the time in the church. If I come to church, I, can, I'm, I become holy just by walking in the front door. And shoot, if you're going to challenge me to get to work with Project In as much, all the better. Because now I'm really proving myself. And I'm really going to shine before the Lord. And God's going to weigh me in the balance and say, you know, you did a pretty good job. 
And the Lord's saying, we need to get something straight here. That's not the way it works. In fact, if you come to me and your heart is not right, your heart is not given to me, any good stuff you may do, you're just going to spoil. You think about what he said in the, through the prophet Isaiah, where God speaks to Isaiah and the people have been idolatrous out there in the streets, but then they walk into the temple and they're offering prayers, they're offering incense, and God says, who asked these things of you? You come and offer prayers to me, I'm not even going to listen to you. These sacrifices, they're detestable to me. And it had been easy for them to answer, well, God, you're the one who asked me to bring these things. What do you mean who asked these things of you? Of course you did. He says, no, what I asked for was your heart. And then out of, out of a heart that's been given to me, then offer these things and I will receive them with pleasure. But if you're bringing these things to me in a way to, to try to buy my favor, if you're going to try to make me your debtor where you say to me, okay, God, I did my stuff, now you owe me, I'm not going to play that game with you. And that's what he's saying here. So like, get to work, but understand how this works. You do have a duty to bring these things to me to work on the house of the Lord, but don't think that this earns you my favor. My favor only comes by grace. And that's why I think that he ends there with that line, from this day on I will bless you. He says, consider your lives. Mildew. Hail. Blight. These are the works of your hands. But I, I will offer you blessing. Just bring your heart. Bring me your heart. I think if, if Daniel were to think that any of you understood him to say, let's get up and serve this community and serve this church, and in that way you will earn God's favor, that would break his heart. He would say, come to the Lord and get right with him, and then let us work together through the grace that he gives us. Now, in the interest of time, I need to move on. Finish it up, starting at verse 20. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. And there is a lot of stuff that we could talk about in there. But I just want to get to the point, because my time is up. Things have been moving slow. They're working, but things are coming together slowly. And Zerubbabel Zara, may be thinking, you know, in the grand scheme of things, again, what's the point? We're just a little blip on the map. Little city little work, and here I am, as the Bible declares him, as Haggai describes as governor of Judah. You know, Zerubbabel was a descendant of the king. He was descendant of King Joachim, who was king when God judged Israel. God said to Joachim, I, I have you like a, a signet ring on my finger, but you know what? I'm done. I'm taking you off. And now here's Zerubbabel. He's, he, he should be a king. He's the lineage of the king. And here he is in this ruined city, slowly making prox uh, progress, saying, what, what's the point? God says, because I'm not done with you. I'm going to restore your family line. Through you, Zerubbabel, I'm, I'm, I'm putting the signet ring back on. I've got a greater work to do, and you are a part of it. There will be a day where the glory of this place will outshine the glory that came before. I will raise up from your lineage, in fact, the king of kings. And you are playing a part in this because if we turn to Matthew chapter 1, we will see the genealogy of Christ and whose name is in that genealogy. Is there a bubble? God is doing a work that he could not even imagine. And that promise still remains here for us because we might say, again, what is the point? We are but a small church in a small town in an area in North Carolina nobody even knows about. And God says, I am doing a greater work than you can even imagine. The prophecy given through Haggai still stands. Hebrews chapter 12. 
Let's see if this sounds familiar. <clears throat> These are people who are under persecution, suffering. They're tempted to give up. <clears throat> see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks, meaning God. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. He is using the language of Haggai to these people saying, you focus on that which cannot be shaken. Because God is doing a mighty work and you are playing a part. Why should you be focused on Project N as much? Why should you be at work in the town around us? Why should you be loving people? Because you are part of a work that God is doing. A work that will culminate in this King of Kings coming back in all his glory. And he will look upon you and say, well done, good and faithful servant, for you have been working towards the same ends that I have been working. And we say, well, how do we go about doing that? We don't have the temple to work at. Well, what's Jesus say? And as much as you have done this, the least of these, my brethren, so you've done it unto me, Right? This is how we work. And again, I commend Daniel for being the voice of calling you to the service. As so if we think about how Haggai started, and I told you I was going to come back, this is how I'm closing. And Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, this is chapter 1, verse 12. Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. When the work began, when they recognized that someone who had been sent by God was calling them to obey and they feared God. Did God send Daniel here for you guys? Is he the messenger sent by the Lord? And do you fear the Lord? That it only stands the reason that you hear his call to get up, church. Let's go. We've got a job to do. And we do that for the glory of the king. So I'm going to pray for us. And I'm going to ask Daniel, he can come up here. And if you feel like the Lord has spoken to you, I, I'll praise the Lord if he has spoken to you. I, I feel like I've done uh, in my rapid fire delivery. I wish I, we could have hovered over some of those passages there a little bit longer, but if the Lord was pleased to call you to get busy for his kingdom in a way that you've not done for your pastor, there's nothing more encouraging that you could do for him than to come up and say, Pastor, I'm here with you. And so I'm going to pray and then ask him to come up here. And as we sing to close out, come up and give him a word of encouragement. And let's see what the Lord is going to do. Let's pray. Lord God, I just ask your blessings upon uh, your word, that you will have used it to, to challenge and confront our hearts, shape and mold our thinking, call us to obedience where before uh, we were focused on ourselves. Let us set aside our own paneled houses and let us focus on your house. Let us take our eyes off of ourselves and place our eyes upon Christ and then go out and serve others in His name, knowing that as we do so, we indeed serve Him. God bless Lillington Baptist. You have great things that you intend to do in this place. Bless their works. Blessed to the glory of your name, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.